Right. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about evaluation of AI models. I, I know that you had a similar lecture yesterday, but, you know, but I think this topic is really so important that I think maybe even five lectures would be enough. And I'll explain why. Because I think it's actually a very, I think it's a very difficult and a very under, um, I think it's a very underappreciated, the difficulty of this topic is very underappreciated. Okay, so just, just like yesterday, you know, I would just like to highlight that the purpose of this talk is that you learn things and, you know, I, I don't get any points for doing this. And, uh, you know, like, you're here. So, you know, I don't have to say, actually, I don't actually have to, you know, like, ask me questions if you, if you don't find something clear. I think it's really much more interesting for everybody to, um, you know, to, to kind of to, under, to, to ask questions because otherwise, you know, like if someone has a question that you will, maybe, you know, other people have the same you know, question. And also, I have some slides, but we don't really have to go through all of them. We can just, you know, we can just go through, we can just go through some of them or, you know, or maybe even a small fraction of them and we can stop when we find something, you know, worth discussing. Uh, and again, I would like to highlight that, you know, it is, it is possible to have a very shallow understanding of many different things, but uh, I think that's really not that, uh, I think it's really not a way to be a scientist in the long run. I think you should really try to understand things very deeply. But, you know, at the same time, I don't, I'm not going to be able to teach you everything about this topic. You know, people write PhDs on it. So it's, it's not something that I can, maybe I can give you, you know, maybe I can give you like a, you know, understanding of two per, the most important 2% and then, you know, maybe give you an idea of what to read about the remaining, I don't know, maybe, maybe what to read about maybe 20%, but there's an, you know, other, you know, 78% that, uh, that you have to discover yourself. Um, I will focus on classification here, although that there's a lot of different possibility, possibilities. Um, and I think this probably might be, I'm not sure if this is going to be the most important lecture for you because you already had the other lecture on a similar topic, so maybe that's going to be the most important lecture, but I think this is definitely the most important topic, I think. Um, you know, and the reason for this is that, you know, there's a lot of bad science. And I think you should, you know, and I think you should really, you should really take this into account in your plans for science, you know. Um, so there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, it's not that scientists want to do bad science, it just happens. You know? And very often, you know, especially in, uh, you know, in applied sciences, this is because they just don't correctly evaluate their models. So they reach conclusions which are, you know, so they reach conclusions which are just invalid. You know, and some people waste years and years and years of their lives pursuing something that just doesn't make sense because they apply incorrect evaluation. So just, you know, don't be those people. You know, learn, learn correct evaluation, don't waste your life. Okay. Um, okay, so now if I have to explain again, you know, much of the kind of position what I'm going to talk about, if I had to explain machine learning in just one slide, it would be like that. That, you know, in machine learning you have you have the data, or well, the training data, and you are using it to train something, right? Like, it, it might be very many different things, and then you try to evaluate it, evaluate the predictions from this something on the test set, um, and in the meantime, you have to do some learning, right? I mean, that's really what it is. And, you know, and, but to, to be able to do learning, you also have to do some kind of, with almost all possible machine learning models you can imagine, you also have some kind of hyperparameter selection process. And um, sometimes you just don't think about it consciously, but, you know, it, it always happens. Even if you, you know, even if you select these hyperparameters somehow automatically, uh, without thinking. Okay, so just let us go through. Can you let's just go through a few examples? 
Okay, so first of all, okay, so maybe before we do this, you know, okay, like you know, there you must have heard about these all of these types of machine learning. Obviously, they all of them have slightly different evaluation methods, and, and we would not be able to discuss them all here. So we're just going to focus on supervised learning, and with supervised learning, we are uh, specifically going to focus on classification. Okay, so but what specifications, right? Maybe like just kind of on a very uh, on the very let's say basic level, right? Classification, you know, a classifier f is a function, right? It's just it, it, it's it's a very particular function, but it's still a mathematical function, and it is taking some kind of an arbitrary set as input. It could be anything, right? There there are classifiers, you know, classifying images, music, text. Or some combinations of these, and then we want to we want to map this x to some map from x to some kind of a discrete set, right? To this set of categories. Um, so okay, in a very you know kind of the most the most uh, the most simple example I could think of, you know we have these so we have we want to map from this set of images. To you know, to a set, to a discrete set of you know, strings, whether dog, you know, dog and cat. So we want to have some kind of a machine learning model that's going to take each element of this space and uh, give us, you know, and give us a prediction, or actually give us a label, right? Like, I mean, give us a discrete, discrete label for each element. And um, I think I've already mentioned. You know, so I have already mentioned uh, those k nearest neighbors as the very basic type of a classifier, where you know you have let's say this is a two-dimensional data, so this could be you know maybe for example, well I don't know what this is exactly, but you know maybe this could be maybe maybe this is you know like the data from the iris data set where the x-axis is the pedal width and the uh, y-axis is the pedal length, and there are three possible classes. Uh, and we okay. And the basic, the most basic model we could do, we could use is, it's a one nearest neighbor, right? So we would just look at every point on this two-dimensional space, and uh, to make a classification of whether of you know on whether which to, to which class this point depends, we would just look at the nearest neighbor. But you know we could also select five nearest neighbors. And as you can see, those predictions are actually quite different. So even though, okay, so the good thing about this model is that it has no hyper, it has no parameters, right? There is, there's no, basically, like the learning process here is trivial. There's no, there's no, you know, there's no parameters in this model, right? That we, if we haven't learned. If we haven't, if we haven't been doing any kind of optimization to find some kind of optimal, optimal parameters, but every time we want to make a prediction, we have to do optimization by searching this entire space, right? So if I, so if I look, if I look at this point here, I have to actually, you know, I have to actually look, find five nearest neighbors, and you know, this is easy for okay. So one, this is easy for uh, low-dimensional spaces. But if it's a high-dimensional space, it has to be, you know, maybe like a space of images, this could be, you know, it could be like a vector of, you know, it, be, it might be very difficult to find a nearest neighbor in high-dimensional space. Um, and it also might not be very uh, sample efficient learning. Because you will just, you will just, you know, in high-dimensional spaces, the kind of you know, distances are, are not necessarily very meaningful. Okay. Now there are no hyperparameters. Okay, so there are no parameters, but there are hybrid parameters, right? So the number of nearest neighbors is a hyperparameter. So we have to somehow be able to make a decision on how many of these nearest neighbors we are considering. And this is not necessarily that trivial. It is. It is kind of simple in this model because there is only one hyperparameter, but there could be models which have you know maybe ten or twenty hyperparameters. Um, okay, and and now 
we're going to go in the direction of the logistic regression, which is also a classifier, but it's it's a little bit it's a little bit different from the classifiers that um, we looked at just a minute ago because it is first of all parametric, so it, it has a certain parameters we actually have to learn. Um, so you know, and it is it is also I think very a bit very interesting model because this is you know kind of like the simplest neural network that you can think of. It doesn't have a hidden layer. It only has a it only has an input layer and output layer, <laughs> right? Um, but okay, but okay, but where does okay, but maybe you know okay. So in fact, I think many people I think perhaps know know about logistic regression, but. I bet if I ask you, okay, where does this logist, where does this expression for p p hat come from? Probably very few people know here, and it's coming from this assumption, right? So we're making an assumption that we can model this ratio between the predicted probability of the positive class and the negative class because we are assuming this is a binary task, right? There's only p and one minus p. We are assuming that we can model this as a linear function of the inputs. And if we do some kind of relatively simple math, <laughs> we're going to arrive at this, right? So if you, okay, so, so basically this is where this, so, so if you've seen this expression, I, I, I imagine you've seen this hundreds of times, uh, this is, it's coming from the assumption above. And you know, and we can very easily uh, compute this for the given numbers, and for this particular, so for this particular example, we can state that the predicted probability that this that this vector, you know, this vector that is composed of one zero and minus one, uh, represents a positive class is 0 0.7, 0 0.73. But if you remember what I spoke about a few slides ago, I have shown you that classifier classifier makes a prediction, you know, like the maps this input space into a discrete space. And this space is clearly not discrete. Right? It's a continuous space between 0 and 1. So we have to have some kind of a... So to, you know, in practice, let's say if I, you know, in practice, let's say you, okay, you think of, okay, it's a little bit cold, you know, and it's, it's cloudy, you know, and you're thinking, and you're thinking, oh, you know, maybe uh, there's like a 60% probability I'm going to go out, right? Like you have to somehow discretize it because you cannot come, you cannot go for a walk at 60% probability. You actually have to go or not, right? So, um, so there's so, so we have to so we have to somehow discretize these predictions, and um, it, it is okay. So this is actually sounds trivial, but. It's actually, I think it is actually a very impractical problem. This is actually how to discretize predictions is a very, it's a, it's a, I would say it's a never ending, it's a never ending problem, right? So here what we are, what you can see is this axis between, with this interval between zero and one. These green stars are examples of um, negative, of cases that we know that are negative. And they're predict, and you know, where they are, this axis represents how much the classifier believes that uh, this example actually is positive, right? And the red stars are the positive cases. And again, the location of this interval represents how much the classifier believes that um, believes that this, this example belongs to the positive class, right? So, okay, so, okay, so for example, like this one, we know that the ground truth for it is, you know, maybe zero, okay, maybe it's, okay, we know that the ground truth for it is that this is the positive class, and the classifier has predicted that with 60% probability, approximately, it belongs to the positive class, right? So, but we have to, you know, but we have to make these discrete predictions. So, what we do to select this point, so we have to select something called an operating point. Um, and it's not, and, you know, and it's not clear what is where this operating where this operating point is supposed to come from. Because for a different for each problem, even for the same data, this operating point might be different, right? So let's imagine. Okay, so if you think, for example, about uh, these being, you know, some kind of, let's say, uh, you know, if, if this is okay, basically, let's just say that this is, you know, some kind of probability that 
uh, you will participate in some events. Um, in some event, it's very dangerous for you, right? And, um, and then you want to make a decision whether to go home or not, <laughs> right? So if you, so you, you would like to be very conservative about going out if there's something dangerous, there's something dangerous can happen to you. So you would choose, you know, so you would choose this operating point to be at a very, you know, to be very low. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you don't, if you don't care so much about, you know, if you don't care so much about the outcome, maybe you can, you can afford more false positives or false negatives, and you're okay. So, okay, so how to set this operating point is actually, you know, it's an ever-present problem in machine learning. Okay, now, in neural networks, this all becomes more complicated. And, but again, neural networks are just, you know, like logistic regression, except that, you know, we just have these hidden layers, right? So, I mean, I've heard, I've heard that you've already studied that. Uh, but it's, you know, but this is just like logistic regression, except that, you know, this out so except that you have multiple layers of, you know, multiple layers of connections. And, um, and you have, yeah, you have these hidden layers, and, it's, you know, the prediction about the classes, you actually get the output there, so. And um, in these kind of models, the learnable parameters are the are represented by the weights on the edges. So this okay. So this kind of a neural network is the possibly the simplest neural network. It's called the fully connected network because uh, we are not assuming anything special about the structure of the of the of the connection between these different neurons. And then. Okay, and then learning in neural networks amounts to just adjusting the weights of a network such as the output matches the training data. Okay, so this is just like, so that doesn't differ very much from logistic regression or uh, in fact any other parametric model, but in neural networks uh, you just have typically more uh, Freedom in matching in matching in you know in using um, in matching the the labels and training data because this network because neural networks are very expressive so it's relatively easy to uh, match your training data on one hand but on the other hand that also could cause overfitting. Okay. Now. Okay. So the reason why I okay so the reason why I'm, I'm talking about this is that I'm actually introducing. I'm introducing something, it is going to become clear in a second. So, okay. So, you know, like a learning in a neural network is actually this equation. So, okay, this sounds very simple, right? But basically, what it is, is we look at the weights of the neural network or the parameters of the neural network at time t minus one, and we are trying to adjust those ways such that we better match the we better match the data right and how well we match the data is 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 encoded in this function l right so we just compute the gradient of this loss with regard to the parameters of the network and we eval we evaluate it at this uh, we well, i mean this is just a so this is a function right this is another just derivative we evaluate it at that point, and we just make a step in, we make a step towards minimizing this so that we are closer to you know, so, so that we are closer to uh, minimizing the loss. And um, okay, so and the most commonly used uh, loss function in uh, the world of neural networks is, is this. Again, it's very simple. So it is just a okay, so this is just a logarithm of the probability of the correct class. Predicted probability of the correct class. Right? So if this probability is equal to zero, so if the okay, so it cannot be equal exactly zero, but if it's very close to zero, then the logarithm function has a shape such that okay, also because there's a minus here, the the logarithm function has such a shape that this loss is very large. Right, but for but if this model perfectly predicts the correct class, 
then the logarithm of one is zero. So what we're trying to do here, and we also average over the training set, right? So what we're trying to, so what we're trying to do in this process is essentially just um, adjusting the predictions of this neural network such that for every training input, we get the correct output, right? That's very simple. Okay, but you know, okay, but the crucial thing here that I didn't, you know, that I didn't mention is like, what is this a? What is alpha, right? What's alpha? Like alpha is a hyperparameter. It's a hyperparameter that indicates how quickly we try to how quickly we try to optimize this function. And this is actually a, so this is probably the most important hyperparameter in deep learning. So if you ever if you ever have computational resources. You only optimize one hyperparameter, you should always optimize the learning rate. Okay, now okay, so now okay, so now we are okay, so basically okay, so basically that's the kind of that's uh that's a very important that's a very important uh, thing in your in, in you know in your networks. Okay. Okay, so okay, but now we're going to get okay, we're going to get to kind of you know, to the to the bottom of things, but before we go there, like do you have any questions about what we discussed so far? Or does anybody does everybody understand everything? Or I mean okay, okay, so okay, so who okay. So is there okay, is there anything in my talk so far that someone hasn't understood? Or everybody understands everything perfectly? Um which slide? This one? Cool. Okay. So what? What? Okay. What's What's about this slide? Uh, no, I just want to kind of remind remind of this thought that Alpha is a learning like also in deep learning such as tools. Now I understand it. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So that was cute for the sort of like moment. Okay. So no, seriously, any questions? Everybody understands everything. No, okay. What do you all understand? I I had only one here. Oh, okay. So I mean, okay. So so is this? Do you find this difficult? Mm, well, mostly for me, it's like you are trying to say something, but you speak another language. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's okay. Let's okay. So let's try to okay. So let's try to okay. I mean, that's okay. You know, we have, we have time. Right? I mean, look, I'm stuck here, right? It's like, what am I going to do? Okay, so, um, okay, so let's, okay, let's go back here, right? Okay, so this is a neural network, right? Okay, maybe this is, this is not the simplest one, but this is close to the simplest one. And the simplest neural network is the logistic regression, where we basically take the inputs, we we take each element of the input. Okay, so let's maybe let's go back to the logistic regression. Okay. Can you give an example? Like, I don't know. Okay, so what could be input and what could be output? Oh, okay. So let's say okay. So here, you know, so okay. So here, this could be, you know, maybe. Okay, this is okay. So maybe let's just say that. Uh, okay, so let's just say that the input is maybe your weight, height, and age. And the output is maybe the probability that you're going to become a basketball player. <laughs> okay, I mean this is so. Of course, if you're you know like really small and very heavy, and you're old, you're not going to be a basketball player, right? <laughs> Probably it's fairly unlikely. Um, so you know, so so what we're okay. So so what we're trying to okay. So this is a very simple problem, here, right? And uh, of course, like I would have to make these. You know, represents age, weight, and you know, age, weight, and height. Um, and of course, you can, you know, you can, um, you can come up with other uh, other things that this could be, right? But but basically, the whole I mean, the whole point is that you take this vector, right? This is a vector. You multiply this by some numbers, each element separately, right? Okay. You sum them up. And then you put them here as an set, and that gives you the probability. 
right? So we say, so we say, okay but, the, okay, but the important thing about this is that all you do is you just really, you know, you just, all, everything that you have done here is just, you know, like multiplication of, it's basically just, what is this, what is it called? It's just a, you know, it's just a uh, multiplication of two vectors. Right? And then computation of an so you just multiply these two vectors and then you just and then you just apply the linear function. Right? So this is so this is yeah, so this is a linear function. And that's it. And you can you know you can keep repeating the same thing, right? So there's nothing there's nothing that stops you from building much more complex networks than this one. And a neural network, you know, okay, so a neural network is essentially just like a super sized version of the same thing. You just don't have to you just don't have to stop at you know, just don't have to stop at just one layer. You can build multiple layers, and you know, and like build a layer on top of a layer on top of a layer. It's a, uh, I mean, it's it's kind of you know. I mean, maybe this is this sounds somehow you know this sounds some, somehow maybe crazy, but it works, right? It's uh, and so the idea, the idea, like the you know the kind of the early inspiration for neural networks was that. Uh, actually came from neuroscience. So people, you know, people who like read neuroscience papers, they, you know, they read that brain processes information in multiple stages, right? So they thought, oh, okay, we're going to, you know, like we're going to make something like this. Just we're going to make computation models like that, right? So, but there's okay, but there's nothing new. I mean, there's, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing amazing here, right? And. Uh, and you know, just like these beta num just just like these beta numbers in this previous slide on the basic regression, you know, these are these are you know, I could put some numbers here that would represent you know that would represent what we would multiply these these inputs by, and that would be some kind of learnable parameters of this network, right? And then yeah, and like I said, you know, just okay, the only thing you can control here. So we cannot change it. We mean, cannot change the structure of the network. We are assuming the structure is fixed. So all we can do, we can change the parameters, right? So we can we can change the parameters, and what we're trying to do is we can we're just trying to fit. Okay, basically we we just trying to we just trying to fit historical data. We're trying to adjust the parameters such that this neural network can rep, can replicate historical data. Right? So in the hope that if we do that, we're also going to be able to make predictions about new data. Right? So if I take, so you know, so if I take maybe like uh, the, you know, maybe you know, so maybe if I take like a subset of regular people and you know and I measure their weight, height, and age, and then I take a subset of players in the NBA and I measure their weight, height, and age, and I make this neural network memorize this relationship then hopefully you know I hopefully I can take a new person and I can decide whether this is an NBA player or maybe not an NBA player. Right? Um, okay so now here this is something okay so now coming back to this right all this all this is right okay so okay so basically there is this we are all this equation represents is just our attempt to fit the parameters of the network such that it better represents the training data. Mm -hmm. Just for the spawner, could you just dissect it because I yeah. don't understand the difference? Sure. Okay, so sure. Of course. So okay, so this so these are the parameters. So these are the, okay, so let's just say we've been training, so basically we're training this network training, training, training a little bit, right? And then we're looking at this training at a certain at a certain point in time in training, right? And you know, let's say let's say we call this point t minus one, right? So this is just let's say this is step t, t minus one. It doesn't it doesn't mean anything, right? It's just a certain point in time, okay? And what we want to do is we want to okay. We know that okay. So we know that we want to optimize this function, right? So basically, what, what this function is, this function has this property. That when we are correct, this value is zero, right? Because the logarithm of one, like if this if this network was always predicting the correct class, then this would always be one, and the logarithm of one is equal to zero. While 
if this if this prediction of the correct class was very far off, it was close to it was close to zero, then that then you know then that would be up close to minus infinity. Because that's just the shape of the logarithm function. So we're trying to minimize this function, right? So we're trying to minimize this function, and what we're doing is we are taking we're doing, using something called gradient descent. So we are so we are looking at the parameters at a certain point in time, and we are computing we are computing the gradient of these parameter of, of this loss function with respect to the parameters, and we are trying to make a small step in the space of the of those parameters of the network such that we slightly better fit the training data. So it's a, I mean, so we had, so okay, so, so this is called gradient descent. Um, okay, so of course, okay, so you know, actually there is a, I mean, it's a simple equation, but there's, I would say there's like usually probably like a thousand papers, or more than a thousand papers that of people, for, you know, written by people who introduce some variations of this. Because this is the simplest possible thing, but you know, but you can you can do a lot of things with this with just this equation. Uh, so if you heard of things like, so you know, if you have heard, if you have heard of things like uh, like adaptive learning or something, or you know, or uh, you know, or stochastic gradient descent, and all of this, right? These are all variations of these two equations. You can basically just you can you know you can you can put some variations on what this function should look like exactly, if it puts some variations in, in you know, if, whether this alpha is constant or whether this is some kind or whether this is, you know, also some function of, of you know, of the number of steps, et cetera, et cetera. But, but the important thing is that, you know, but the important thing is that, okay, however, whatever you do, you have this hyperparameter here. And we have to somehow deal with, you have to somehow deal with this selection of this hyperparameter uh, Without any kind of a prior, often without any kind of a prior knowledge of what this of what this should be. I mean, this could be one. This could be maybe I don't know, ten to the minus three. Who knows, right? Uh, so if you you know, say so if this is if this time parameter is too large, we're never going to be able to optimize this function because we'll be shooting too far. Too far. If it's going to be too small, you're never going to go to the minimum. Um, but yeah. So all right. Okay, so um, well, there are two problems, right? So with evaluation of classifiers. So one problem is that you have to divide the data set somehow. And you have to know what metrics to use. So what I mean, okay, so what I mean by dividing data set is that, you know, you have, let's say, you collected your data. Which may be, you know, like 100 samples in this data, and you have to, and you have to do training, validation, and tests, right? So I mean, this is like a classic, classic thing you must compare, it. right? And how you do this is actually not necessarily obvious. And then what metrics to use is actually also not necessarily obvious. Okay, so okay, so I think this is probably something that maybe you should. This is something you should really memorize, right? So when you have this entire data set of one hundred examples, you always have to have some kind of a subset of this. To do the training, you have to have some kind of some some subset of it to do validation for selecting hyperparameters, and you have to have some kind of if you have some subset of the data to compute the test set, right? So this test set is to check how accurate the model is, and um, it is extremely important that you understand this division. I think if you actually I think if you, you know, like, this is, I mean, this is the most serious problem that, uh, this is the most serious problem that people have, not understanding this line. Because when you, you know, like when you really don't, when you really don't understand it, you really can really do bad things. For example, you know, if you do training on, if you do training and test on the same data, you can very easily um, be optimistic, right? So if you, so you know, if you have, if you use the training for a very long time, like if you train any methods for a very long time, you will eventually perfectly, you eventually perfectly memorize 
your training data. And even if you have, you know, just a few data points, especially if you have, well, in fact, in fact, especially if you have a very small data set, you will memorize this, you will memorize your training data. But then if you test, but if you, but if you use again training data to test your model, it, it's basically you have a very optimistic idea on how accurate it's going to be when you throw away your model into the world, right? So you always, so, so okay, so at the very minimum, you always have to have a separate training data and a separate separate test data, right? That's that's you know like if you if you don't do that, you know if you don't if you don't do that you're doing really bad, okay? Now it's also very this validation is also very important, but it's also very important it's very important to understand this is different from the test set. Because even if you, okay, so I often see this kind of pattern, you know, unfortunately, I, some, I mean, I, I try to avoid making characters like this, but I often see this kind of pattern that someone has, someone is training the model on the training data, and that's great, and then they, they're not, okay, then they are using the validation set to select the hyperparameters, and then what they do, they report, they report the hyperparameter, that gave you know and the and the error that gave them the lowest error on the validation set. Right? So this is also not great because you are even though you are not overfitting to the training sets in the literal sense, you are again throwing you're again throwing a dice a few times and sometimes you're going to be lucky. Sometimes you're going to find some kind of, uh, set of a set of hyperparameters on the validation set that works for the validation set, but it's not a guarantee it's going to work for the test set, right? So you're so if you do this, so so if you if you try to so if you try to do your report, so someone is going to then take your paper, you know maybe the model that you possibly that you possibly published. And it's going to put them to their own data, and suddenly, you know, instead of you know, instead of accuracy of 0 0.9, they're, they're going to get like an accuracy of 0 0.6, because you were actually lucky on the validation set. You just, you know, you just pick the hyperparameter that gave you, you just pick the hyperparameter that gave you the, you know, the lowest error on the validation set, which is which is which which, which is very optimistic. Okay, guys, do you understand this? Yes? Okay. Right. Okay. Anyway, just you know, just okay, okay. Okay, is there someone is okay, is there someone here in this room who doesn't accept this? <laughs> no, okay, oh you okay, go ahead. But it's not it's not that I'm Okay. So okay, so okay, this is okay. This is a good question. I'm, I'm glad you asked it. So if you have a model where you have no hyperparameters, right? So let's say, so you know, let's say that let's just say that you let's just say that you kind of decide you want to train like one nearest neighbor classifier. You're not interested in anything else. You're not going to be optimizing neither nearest neighbors. You're not doing any kind of preprocessing that requires some kind of hyperparameter selection. You just want this one specific model. You don't want anything else. Then you train this one model, and it's perfectly fine to use the validation set. But that's because you are in fact using it as if it was a test set. You have never used the validation set to do the hyperparameter selection. So the problem is the problem becomes when you the problem becomes when you do hyperparameter selection, and everything goes out of the window. So you have to so either so you can so you know if you don't want to if you don't want to do hyperparameter selection you basically let's say you can forget about the validation test you don't need it you can just use the test but you know but uh, yeah, so then then you can do this but this is the only case where it actually I mean this is the only case where it makes sense. Uh, do you have an example hyperparameter like uh, from the regular example? Yeah, like the, so you know in case there's neighbors. K is a hyperparameter. Uh, number, number of classes. Number of, no, so the, the, it's not K means, it's not class means. Yeah. It's, K, it's K nearest neighbors. So number of neighbors that you yeah. 
that you're using to that you're using to uh, classify is a hyperparameter, right? So this is the, so, so let's say so you know, so k so let's say k k and k nearest neighbors is probably the most primitive, let's say hyper hyperparameter. The other another set of another example of a hyperparameter is this alpha, right? Like the learning rate the, the learning rate in you know in uh, gradient descent is uh, you know we say uh, so that's okay that's another. Um, maybe you can repeat again what's the difference between just parameters and hyperparameters. Okay, so the parameters are okay. So the parameters is something that you adjust in the process of learning, right? So, so you know, in the logistic regression. So in the logistic regression, let's say, let's go back to this example of logistic regression. Right? So in the logistic regression, these beta are parameters, right? They are they are they, they basically you try to learn them. Uh, and which in the logistic regression is hyperparameter. So there is no hyperparameter here. And uh, for example, for chi nearest neighbors, what is ah, that's, a, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. Okay. So the funny thing is that k nearest neighbors don't have parameters, mm -hmm. only hyperparameters. <laughs> right? uh, uh, can you suggest the situation when we have both? Yeah, 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 yeah sure. Sure. So, okay, so, so, okay. so k nearest neighbors has only, has only hyperparameters, no parameters. Logistic regression only has parameters but no hyperparameters as such, right? But the hyperparameter here is in the learning process, right? So this alpha is hyperparameter. So this is, you know, so using this, okay, so basically this, you know, so using this equation, you can train, you know, you can train uh, logistic regression or a neural network. But this learning rate, like how quickly you are, how quickly you are adjusting, you know, uh, how quickly you are you are learning in hyperparameter. Okay. Uh, yeah. So okay. So 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 just just to come back to your question. Okay. So I, okay. So a a parameter is something that you are adjusting in the process of learning to such that such that on the training data. Uh, such that you kind of memorize the training data to a degree at least, and a hyperparameter is something that is something that is something that controls this process of learning. So it's not directly adjusted in the process. It's not directly adjusted in the process of learning. So is it like if we didn't have the hyperparameter, we would also say? So okay. So one example I think is okay. So okay. So. Um, like, okay, I think you had this last. I think you had this lecture on logistic regression, right? Or linear regression, right? So, in, so linear in linear regression, those, you know, you, I don't know how you, I don't know how you, you know, how you call them in that lecture, right? But you had, but you had some kind of parameters we're learning, but then I imagine you also had regularization, right? So, the, so there is some kind of a regularization. People, it's a regulation. It's a regulation high parameters, right? Because you because you don't adjust it in the process of learning, you select it somehow. Uh, anyway, so so it's so I don't know if you yeah I'm not sure if that makes sense. Does it make sense to you? Yes. Do you always like kind of actively select it or usually kind of? Okay, so algorithms are there that select for you. Okay, so ideally, of course, you have ideally, of course, you have very few hyperparameters, ideally none, because hyperparameters are a problem, right? Because you have to select them. But you know, but um, but you, but but you know, but sometimes you just have to have them. Right, so then, so then you have to you have to have some kind of a mechanism for selecting them. And um, okay, so I mean, we're going to talk about the, we're going to talk about this a little bit, right? But you know, but okay, but the most um, like historically, the historically the most uh, um, the most frequently used methods for selecting hyperparameters is something called mean search. So let's just say you have maybe you know like a few hyperparameters. Like, like learning rate or whatever else or regularization hyperparameters, and you just you know you just you just let's say define five that you try in both, 
and then you and you of course you have to try all combinations, right? So you have to try like so 25 combinations of the hyperparameters. Uh, so you try all of them. You evaluate, okay, you try you try training your model using all of these sets of hyperparameters, using training sets, you evaluate all the validation sets, and then you select you select the hyperparameters that gave you the best result on the validation set. You take the model, you evaluate on the test set. And then you can, you know, and then you know that you have, let's say, you can have an unbiased estimator for the performance of your model on the test set. I mean, I mean, on the test set you get the, you get the unbiased estimate of how the model is going to perform in the real world, assuming that the real world is using the same distribution of data as the test set. Um, so, for every step of this uh, term of hyperparameter search, you have to use the same validation set, or is it better to get uh, we're going to get there. So, so you know. Okay, so this is okay. So I would just say this is the simplest valid solution. But you know, but people have been talking, but people have been you know designing these kind of procedures for hyperparameter selection and you know and uh, validation stuff much longer than machine learning was really kind of an active field. You know, so because this is something that stems from statistics really more than machine learning. Um, so this is, you know, so this is this is really, the, you know, let's say, like this is the simplest possible solution that if you really, if you understand it and apply it correctly, you're going to, your results are valid. And then there are some more complex procedures that have some desirable properties, but they are much harder to implement. So, okay. What was the question? Was the question? No? Okay. Any questions? Okay, so okay, I'm glad okay, I'm glad we had this conversation. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So now okay, so what is the problem with this? Um well it's 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 valid, right? It is correct, but what if you only have one hundred examples? Right? You will you will like if you if you have a very small number of examples, you won't like to have many examples for training, and you will have very few left for the validation and very few for test. And if you, you know, only if you only estimate your error on the ten examples in the validation set, then of course it's going to be a very noisy estimate. So that's why, you know, and that's why there are all of these that's why there are all of these procedures that capable with validation. And I think you I think you have you have I, I believe you have learned a little bit about this yesterday. Uh, I you know in principle it's a so it is a very it's very similar to what I described to you, but um, but it's a little bit more complicated, right? So here, I would, okay, here is a this is a very simple version of cross validation where there are ways you were partition data into three groups, right? So you know and and then okay so so basically there are let's say. I would say there are three iterations of these procedures, right? So in the first iteration, this is the training data and this is the validation data. Then this is the training data and this is the validation data. And in the third iteration, this is the validation data and this is the training data. And you know, you can, again, um, you can, okay, so basically how would you do it? How would you now use it, right? So, okay, so first you have to define some kind of set of hyperparameters. And then for each set of the hyperparameters, you would okay. You would now iterate over the k's in the k-folds in the k-folds validation, right? So you would train the model on the training set, evaluate the model on the validation set, then select the best model based on the average validation error, and then evaluate the best model on the test set. Okay. So okay. So. Okay, so how do you interpret this, right? So okay, so k, okay, so k is you know, okay, k is between one and three, right? So you would first, okay, so you first train this model on this data, you evaluate it here, right? And that gives you some kind of validation, one, let's say one, uh, one value for an error. Then you train, then you train on this, you evaluate this, that gives you another error, right? And again, you train on this and you evaluate this, and that gives you the further error. And you average these errors, and that's your let's say that's your value for of an error for a given hyperparameter, mm -hmm. right? And then you select the and then you select the value which is best, 
with regards to some metric, and then you evaluate in the test set. Right? So it is so this is okay, so why is it better? Well the reason why it's better is because you can because you can suddenly you know you have a much better estimate of an error. Because you average it over you average it over you know multiple validation sets. So I mean there's some simple math that you can show that that will show you that the variance of the estimate is smaller. Are parameters here completely in the yeah, so the, par so the parameters are completely independent. You repeat this learning process each time. Yeah. Um, okay, but the great thing about this is that, you know, okay, so, uh, yeah, and you can select, so you know, so, okay, so you can select the hyperparameters, you can evaluate this model. Like, this is a really beautiful procedure, but, um, okay, but there are, you know, there are more complex versions of it. There is a very nasty version nest called nested cross validation. <laughs> Which I think, okay, I mean, I was hoping to, I was hoping to explain this to you in detail, but maybe this is a bit hard. But, okay, but basically, you know, let's say this is, let's say this, this bar is an entire test set. Then what happens in the nested validation is you again take a bit of it and you put it aside. You do a regular k fold cross validation within the rest. Right? And then you evaluate, then you evaluate at the end, treating this as a test set. And you can repeat this again and again. Right? So again you would you would leave a different part of it as a test set. And then you would and then you would have and then you would use this one bit that you left out as a test set, right? Okay. So now I mean this is this really works, but you notice how I mean. You notice how this example, how this picture suddenly, you know, it gets progressively, it gets progressively bigger and bigger, right? From this one to this one, and there are actually I didn't manage to fit the whole thing here, right? I would have to, I would have to also draw, you know, like one version of this, one version, one version of this where you know where this is here, and one version of this where this is here, right? Um, so you know, like this, this kind of becomes computation intensive, especially if you have to if training the models is, is expensive. Um, but you know, but this is still a perfectly valid. So as long as you do this once, right? So as long as you as long as you evaluate as long as you evaluate this whole thing once, so you use the test set once, it's it's a valid procedure. But you know, but it but it suddenly becomes very slow, right? Because you have to you have to iterate both over. Well, basically, you have to choose one bit of the test of this entire data set as the test set, <coughs> and then you have to also perform one cross validation every time. So it, it becomes very complicated. But okay, but you know, but what I would okay, so what I would like you to I think get out of this picture on the nested cross validation is that. You know, there really, so I, I, you know, like there is this world of cross validation procedures that's actually very uh, unsettling. Um, but, you, you know, and there's really a big zoo of them, and they are all targeted at uh, being good at something else. Um, you know, for example, maybe you have heard of Monte Carlo cross validation, Big One Out cross validation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, you, you probably won't necessarily need them. I think k corpus validation is, you know, the kind of corpus validation that's, you know, like ninety percent of examples is actually working very well. But you should know that, you know, there are other, there's more out there, and sometimes a different method might be a little bit more appropriate. Right? Like, for example, like if you have a really, really tiny, tiny, tiny set, big one out corpus validation is is often better, but um, that's very slow. Okay, and. Um, Okay, and what I would like you to okay, and what I would like you to remember is that k fold cross validation is if you forget if okay, so k fold cross validation is a good procedure for selecting hyperparameters, but it it itself doesn't estimate the test error, right? So here in this picture, what I mean by that is that you can you know within the height within Within cross validation here, this part, you can you can select the hyperparameters, 
but the kind of, but the validation error that you that you have here is actually an optimistic estimate of the error. So you can't use this estimate of the error to you know to be your let's say to be your like, you cannot put it in your paper as you know like your prediction of an error on the you know, on the new data set. You actually have to you actually have to have a test set set aside and you actually have to evaluate your model on the separate test set. Or otherwise you, you know otherwise you are otherwise you know you fall into the buckets of bad science. And that's not good. Okay. And you should only evaluate the model of the test set only once. Okay? The yeah. validation that you have How much can you overcome the, the size of your data? Oh, I mean, you can do this. Well, I mean, look, so, of course, if you have like 10 examples, no matter what you do, you're, you're, you know, you're trying to lose. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but I think because validation is very useful. Okay, so, you know, in this setting, right, in the setting where you have just one validation, training validation test set, you know, like if you have like a few hundred examples, you're typically, you know, you're not going to be able to do very much of it. Because this validation, because the, you know, because this, because this, you know, this validation error is going to be very noisy. So you're not going to be able to really select these images very well. So I would say that, you know, cross validation is incredibly useful. You know, in this kind of, in this kind of range, when you have this kind of range of examples that is, you know, often seen in practical, Problems in biological sciences when you have like a few hundred examples, like that really that really helps in these kind of settings. So, um, so I think you know it's very useful, and I think you should use it if you can. Okay, now, okay, so, okay, yeah, and now okay, but, but one more important thing to remember here is that you should evaluate the model and test it only once. Okay, so. And why? Because if you evaluate your model on the test set more than once, then your test set actually becomes some sort of a weird validation set. <laughs> so, so you know, so so, okay, so basically, like a you know, like a correct way of you know, like a correct way of running your project would be that you put some test set aside. You don't look at it. You know, never, never look at it. <coughs> basically, just only look at only look at your test set. When you think you have your final model, and you want to really estimate like, how good this final model is, right? That's, I mean, or if you're going to, you know, it, it's it's hard, right? You have to, you have to somehow restrain yourself not to look at the It's difficult, right? You know, so but this is how, but this is how it should be, so that this is really the real test. Set. Okay, and now, okay, you know, so. So cross validation, you know, it's a great procedure, but it's a little bit cumbersome doing it for a variety of reasons. So you should use it when you don't have large enough validation test sets. But you know, but let's just say that if you're training models on, you know, like millions and millions of you have you have like millions of data points, and, and you don't need cross validation because these problems just disappear, right? Like you have you can have good estimates of the validation error, uh, you know, if you like, if you have if you can have good estimate, estimates of validation error on your data, then was the point of you know having this validation? Okay, so now the second problem, right? So what metrics to use? Okay, so I'm just going to assume that we have binary labels, um, and you know there are generalizations of these metrics to to you know to labels which are not binary, but I think just understanding the binary cases you know is difficult enough. So maybe we're just going to focus on this. Okay, so. Okay, there's a missing parenthesis on the other side. But, okay, so accuracy, okay, so this is the most important picture. You have to keep in mind, you know, I actually, I, 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 always, I always forget, so I actually always have to copy this for myself. Um, but, you know, but okay, accuracy is probably the metric that you're familiar with. Basically, you, you know, you, you compute the number of the examples that you correctly classify, whether these are true positives or true negatives, and you divide it by a Right, so this is kind of okay. So this is a, the most standard metric. the The problem with accuracy comes with um, the class imbalance. So, for example, so think about it this way: if 
let's say, if I want to build a classifier that is classifying whether someone has some incredibly rare disease, and if I always say, okay, and you know, and, and, okay, so if I say you don't have this super rare disease, I'm always going to be almost 100% accurate, right? So, you know, like even if I just say no. So this is the problem, right? So you cannot, so, you cannot, so accuracy is often just not enough and you need something, something better. Um, sometimes people also use this thing called negative of likelihood in the context of classification. So basically they just, negative of likelihood is, is this function that I, okay, this is function, this function here, except that um, normally people use it for training, but there is, you know, like, a, it's a little bit exotic, but people also apply this to the test set. You can do this, right? You can, basically, that, that's also kind of some kind of metric of how well you are classifying. So the problem, the problem with this metric is that it has a lot of variance. So, because, you know, because remember what I said that, okay, the logarithm function has such a shape that, um, if you if you are wrong, you're going to be if you're very wrong, right? Like if you basically if you if you only in one example in test set you make a very wrong prediction, you're suddenly close to infinity, right? So this is a so basically that's, that's so it, it's, that's that's the problem with this metric, right? So that's why you that's why you are that's why you don't see the that often, but sometimes you do that. Okay. So then there's just some precision. Um, but you know, again, to have the but you know to again to remember remember what I thought about this prioritization. To be able to compute these these values, right? True positives divided by true positives plus false positives, you actually have to perform this prioritization first. Right? So you have to you have to look at the data and you say, okay, you know, above the threshold, I'm going to say this is a positive, these are positive, below the threshold, these are negative. Um, so you know, but precision is so, but precision is you know it's a metric basically that you know okay so you look at so maybe first look at uh, the denominator right so we look at all the examples that the classifier predicted to be positive and we and we use it to divide the number of true positives right so we so this is okay so basically what, what does it say so it says what is among the all examples that we consider positive? What is the fraction of the examples that are actually positive? And there's a you know, corresponding metric of recall. So here, you know, it is dividing the okay. So the true positives is divided by again the sum of true positives and false negatives, right? So, um, so that indicates how many positives we actually caught among all positives. Okay, and there are you know there are combinations of this, like such as F1 score, maybe you have heard of this too. The F1 score is just a harmonic mean. If you remember if you remember high school mathematics, that's the harmonic mean. <laughs> right? So this is a so this is the harm, F1 is a harmonic mean of precision and recall. And you know it's somewhere arbitrary, but you know but, but you know it's a good kind of compromise between precision and recall. So people often use it. But you know, but okay, but uh, probably something that you have heard of the most, maybe even though maybe you don't yet understand what it is, is the something called some people call it A U R O C. Some people call it R O C A U C. I'm not really sure what's the kind of you know like what the statistician would really call it, but there is this you know uh, there is this uh, something called receiver operator receiver operating characteristic curve. And you can compute an area under that curve, and that's somehow that's sometimes referred to as an easy. And um, you can do the same thing with the precision recall curve. So you know, in both of these cases, you put something on one axis, you put something else on the other axis. You're observing a trade off between these two, and you're computing the area under under this curve. Okay, so. Okay, but you know, but there's honestly there's there's so many metrics that you can come up with. So I don't think that I can tell you I cannot give you one specific metric you should always use. So this is just 
you just really have to understand what is important for your application to be able to, to, be able to select a metric. I think probably the, you know, the receiver operator characteristic curve is something that is often appropriate. Um, okay, so I guess, I guess you probably have seen this yesterday, right? Have you seen this yesterday? Huh? Sorry? Yes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, and do you think, okay, do you think you understand everything about this? Sorry? <laughs> yes? <laughs> huh? I mean, do you, okay, I mean, so, okay, okay. I know, I know, this is a very, I know, this is a very, bad, I mean, this is a very bad question, but I asked him on purpose. No, I think, you know, so I think this is something that, okay, so I asked him because, you know, this, this curve and the area under the curve, under this curve is, um, I think this is really an abused metric. I, I you know, to be honest, I rarely see someone who understands it. I mean, and I, even though this is a very, I think it's a very important concept. So, you know, I, I, I see a lot of people who, I think especially, you know, like if you look at the, if you look at papers in, you know, like biological sciences or medical sciences and all of these kind of application science, you know, applied sciences, like this is, a, this is something that comes up over and over again. You know, there's, like, Usually, maybe you know, fifty percent of the papers mention this, but it has some really funny properties that I will I will show you some of them, just to kind of just to surprise you. Um, okay, I think you wanted to ask a question. No, I asked what kind of implies. Sorry. Oh, okay, 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 <laughs> all right, okay. So, okay, so you know, okay, I'm, I'm going to okay. So first, we'll we'll begin by trying to compute it. For an example, right? So let's go. Okay, so we have so we have these predictions. So remember that this is on the interval between zero and one, um, and the and we know that the red stars indicate the examples for which we know that they are positive, and the green ones indicate that they are negative, right? But the, but the and the point of, on this on this interval indicates the prediction of the classifier. Okay, and we just want to compute an AUC for for this example. Okay, so how do we do it? Right. So okay, so we, we go back to the definition, and um, we consider. Okay, now the important thing is that the AUC considers all possible thresholds, right? So it considers basically everything here being negative, everything being positive, right? Everything be everything here being negative, everything here being positive. Every Q being negative, every being positive, etc., etc. Et so there is, you know, so there are as many, you know, so there are as many possible thresholds as, okay, so there are as many possible thresholds as number of the test example plus one, right? So you can put, you can put this in. There. Okay, so that's okay. So I, um, that's the curve that you would get, uh, that you would get if you actually computed that, and I'm going to show you how we compute, right? Okay, so, okay, but just, you know, but just what does the AUC actually measure? Well, it actually measures how well the classifier discriminates between these populations. So it measures, it measures how well, how well the classifier discriminates between the green points and the red points. Right? Okay, and it's going to become clearer when we try to compute it. Okay, so we again, we again have this, you know, we again have, this, have, have these definitions because they are hard to remember. And what we're going to do is, you know, a super useful exercise. We're just going to compute these different points on this curve. Okay? So we consider the first, so we consider the first possible threshold. Okay? So at this threshold, we consider all points to be positive. Right? So we have, so how many, okay, so now, okay, so how many, okay, so we have, Okay, and we have to compute the true positive rate and the false positive rate, right? Okay, so let's compute the true positive rate. Okay, so all, okay, so true positive, okay, so we have, so we have three true positives, right? Okay, these are the true positives, so there's three of them. And we're dividing this by number of true positives plus number of false negatives, right? So we, okay, so we divide three by three plus zero because we have no false negatives. 
right? There's no false negatives. Everything is positive. Okay, so it's one. Okay, so true positive for so for that for that threshold, true positive uh, rate is one. And now we compute the false positive rate. So we look at okay. So we look at the false okay. So false positive rate. Okay, so number of false positives is what two, right? These are false positives. These are actually negative, but we classify them as positive. So we divide two. Okay, so we, we so we divide two by two plus zero, right? Because there are no true negatives. Everything we classify as positive. Okay. So okay, so both okay, so both false positive rate and the true positive rate for that example is zero. Sorry, it's one, right? Okay. Okay. So now we look at another version. Um, okay, this is going to get hard. <laughs> All right. So. Okay, so again we will compute true positive rate. Okay, so there are okay, how many how many true positives are there? One. Correct, correct, three true positives. Okay, how many how many false negatives are there? Yeah, zero. Yeah, zero. Okay, yeah, cool, cool, exactly. So the true positive rate is equal to one. Okay, and now we compute the false positive rate, right? Okay, so how many okay, so false positives, how many false positives are there? How many false positives are there? One. Cool, yes, great, okay. Okay, and okay, how many true negatives are there? Yes, okay, so it was a half, okay. So, okay, see, so basically we have the positive rate of one, positive, false positive rate of a half, right? Okay, so here, okay, so here how many true positives, okay, so we're going to compute true positive rate first, okay, how many true positives do we have? Two. two. Yeah, two, three, plus two. Okay. And how many? Okay. Okay. Does anybody understand why we have two two positives? You don't understand? Okay. Well, because we consider this as a threshold, right? And we look and according to the threshold, we classify everything right of this threshold as positive, right? So, and we know. That the ground truth for these two examples is true, is positive. So we have, so among these three examples, so we classify as positives, only two are only two are true positives. So that's why the okay, so the true positive rate is equal to two. Okay, and the false negative, how many false negatives? How many? One. Yes, exactly. exactly. So the true positive rate is equal to two thirds. Okay, the true okay, the false positive rate. Okay, false positives, how many? How many false positives? One, one yes, okay. One false positive and true negatives. One. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, see, okay, guys, you understand how to compute it. Okay, cool. Yeah. So you know we can just keep okay, we just keep repeating this, right? And we're going to get this curve. So okay, so notice that basically what we are what we're really computing is among all possible thresholds. Because we, in the end of the day, we want to compute an area under this curve, right? So among all possible thresholds, how well this classifier is distinguishing between the red stars and the green stars, right? So that's it. Um, okay, and if we, if we do this perfectly, then we're going to have a curve that's going to go you know, in this direction, right? So we're going to have for so we have so we're going to have a very high true positive rate for even for a very small false positive rate. And you know, if we basically if we go, you know, if our classifier, you know, if our classifier gives us a you know a curve like this, then you know then this is a perfect classifier and that's it. This the problem solved. If we you know if we are random you know, if we're random, we're always going to be we're going to be on this on this diagonal. And um, yeah, okay. So so that that that's the you know that's the ROC that's the ROC curve. I, I, I guess you already know how to compute it. But okay, but this is not you know. But there's some problems with ROC. And uh, okay, and, and I'm going to illustrate some. Okay, so let's just say okay, so let's just say that we make predictions like. Like the classifier that we just that we just had, right? Okay, and now that's one classifier. And there's another classifier that makes predictions like this. Okay, so my question is, 
Okay, which classifier has a higher AUC on this test? You got it, yes? Yeah? On the second one. Okay, why do you think so? Yeah, like, 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 <laughs> so, uh, so I, I know, okay, so whatever your explanation was going to be, it was not very correct. Uh, but, okay, but you know, but, okay, but anyway, you know, like, congratulations for trying, you know, like, that wasn't, that wasn't easy. Okay, that's, that's, that, that took some courage to, you know, some courage to, you know, to try to answer. Okay, so, so, this, okay, so classifier, okay, so basically I, I just said that, okay, I just said that uh, this classifier doesn't have a higher use. Okay, now, who wants to make who wants to make the alternative guess? <laughs> okay, okay, you want to make, okay. okay. Why? A has a higher risk because in the Oh, okay. So okay. So okay. Okay. So it was okay. So this is this is supposed to be the most surprising thing you're going to hear during the summer school, but their AUCs are identical. <laughs> Do you believe that? <laughs> okay. So okay. So. It depends how you choose the test. Sorry. Exactly. Well, exactly. The AUC. That's the, that's the whole point, right? So AUC is evaluated for all thresholds, right? So okay, so okay, but for any okay, look, so for any threshold, for any for any possible threshold you consider, like all of these calculations are going to be identical, right? Like because the order is the same. So so okay, so you know, like AUC, AUC just doesn't care about you know like these probabilities at all. You know, it just it just only cares about the order. Okay, do you accept it now? <laughs> okay, yeah. you accept it? Okay. No, do you see what I mean? Because basically, look, so whatever, whatever, yeah, whatever threshold, whatever threshold I pick here, and whatever threshold, whatever threshold I pick here, you know, there are, okay, there are only, the only possible thresholds are between these data. They're just going to give you identical true positive rates and false, and false uh, you know, the identical rates for 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 each of them, right? So basically, the AUC is the same, but you know, but look how different these classifiers are, right? So this classifier is actually very confident and very wrong about this one, and it's also it's also very confident and very wrong about these two examples, right? So this is so even though I would say that like this classifier is probably better because it's not so overconfident, the AUCs are identical. So uh, I think that's uh, you know I think that's a very I think that's a very I mean you know I, I think this is a very surprising I think this is very surprising uh, at least you know I think this is a, at least I think it's very surprising if you never considered how AUC is computed uh, that's a very you know that's a very sad property of AUC okay and the other ones are probably not as sad okay so the other thing is. Okay, so here this is a graph from, from my paper. Uh, GMIC is a type of a classifier. DMD is a type of a classifier. Average reader is, you know, it's like human. It's a human evaluator. evaluator. And then the hybrid is a mixture between, uh, I think, GMIC and the reader. So we can, okay, so we have all of these, we have all of these, you know, these ROC curves for, um, for for these different models, right? Because we can consider humans if they make probabilistic predictions. Also, a machine learning model, maybe not a very perfect one. Um, 
Okay, but what's the okay, but what's the point here? Well, the point here is that you know um, for each problem, you should actually be very careful about interpreting AUC because it is you know each part of this curve is equally important for AUC, right? So you know how so whether you're so whether you're here or here, or this part of the curve here. It is equally involved in computation of the in computation of the of the area under this curve. While some of these, you know, maybe, you know, while depending on what exactly the problem you're considering, you know, either the left or right might be more important to you. you know, so in some settings, for example, when you have, you know, when you really don't want to risk missing, you know, like you might either so you might either not want to risk missing something, and you're very worried about. You're very worried about missing some, you know, missing some events that, you know, if you miss it, it's a catastrophe. But on the other hand, maybe there are some examples where you just don't want to have too many false positives, right? So there are different settings, and you should sometimes look at different parts of this curve. And uh, sometimes people do this. It's called partial AUC, where they either, for example, consider like this kind of only this part of the curve, or you know, or only area under, you know, like here. Uh, so, like you often see this in, like, you know, in um, in like medical sciences or biological sciences. Yeah. yeah. I have a question to the previous slide. How do you score the confidence of, of, of like predictable? Like, How do I score confidence? Well, yes, because the AFC is the same, right? The PRC would be the same probably, yeah. depending on the default. So, how do you score this kind of thing? Okay, so, you know, so this is I think some, this is I think probably an example where actually uh, something like negative likelihood would be useful because it would catch you know it would catch this problem in this network right or this model because if you you know if you were very confident and very wrong then negative likelihood would point this out so you just have to you know you just have to um, I mean this is this is you know this is a kind this is I think that's why I the way I said this. In the beginning, the evaluation of machine learning models is very difficult, right? Because you sometimes, sometimes just one metric is just not enough to have a full picture on um, you know, when it's performed. Okay. Now, okay. There's now there is another problem that AUC is computed for the entire data set, right? So here, okay. So here, what I'm okay again. This is a graph from one of my old papers. And here, each of these colors represents a different model. So we have, you know, so we have four models, and we have two ways of dividing people, right? So we have dividing. We can divide them according to their age, or we can, or can, or we can divide them according to their density of their breast. So like density of the breast is something considered that it's a considered uh, commonly considered as if someone has very dense breasts, they are more likely to get cancer. Um, Okay, and, and you know like the, the weird thing about this is that actually you know this model is okay. I mean I don't know if this is weird or not, but but you know but basically this model is not equally accurate for all types of for all subjects, right? So even though it's quite accurate for those people between sixty and seventy, it's not very okay. This for example this this pink model, <coughs> it's not very accurate for people between uh, fifty and sixty, and. Um, that's you know let's say that's something that's, that's typically overlooked, but you can imagine you know but you can imagine some very nasty consequences of this. For example, you know I mean in, in machine learning it's very common to um, you know let's just say for example if you want to you know if you train your model in you know like in, in Poland, right, and then you deploy it you know, in Africa. You know, if you never tested, you know, if you never tested your model on a certain group of people, it might suddenly turn out that even though it maybe worked very well for Polish people, maybe it doesn't work for people in, you know, South Africa, for example. Right? So AUC is just some a, 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 AUC just, you know, it agglomerates all of these kinds of subgroups and it doesn't show you anything about how well it how well it works for a specific type or specific uh, subgroups of people or some kind of kind of other subgroups. Okay, does, does this make sense? 
Okay. And um, okay, so one more example. Okay, so maybe just to conclude, um, so there's okay. Also, there is a, there is some variance associated with uh, with uh, AUC. You know, there is a true AUC that the classifier has, but we'll never know what it is, right? We can only because we have a small test set on which we're trying to estimate it. This true AUC will this this true AUC is hidden for us. Um, and you know, it has some variance, and we just, you know, we don't know exactly what it is. It might be quite large. Okay, and now a final surprising property. ROC is completely insensitive to changes in the plasma distribution. So what I mean by this is that you can have, you know, let's just say you can have positive cases and negative cases, and then I will suddenly Take the negative case, and then we'll oversample them like crazy. You know, it doesn't it doesn't change the AUC. And uh, I mean, it's very strange, right? If you think about it, but it's true. And the easy way to understand it is is like this. So this is a okay. By the way, so this is a great paper. You should read it. Like uh, if you want to find out more about ROC, it's uh, it's cited like I don't know a million times. Uh, but it's a you know, but it's actually, but but this is actually this is where I found this explanation. So if you look at, you know, so okay, so remember that, you know, remember that we we are when we're computing, when we're computing those points for the, those points on the ROC curve, we're looking at false positive rate and true positive rate. And um, know that the ratio between the, the ratio between positive and negative is never taken into account here, right? So the false positive rate. It's only computed using, you know, using those uh, negative cases, and then true positive rates is used only computed using positive cases. So there is like there's no interaction. It's very strange, right? But it's very strange, but it's true. So uh, you can so basically you can oversample as long as you oversample from the same distribution, you can oversample like a maniac and it won't change the ROC. Um, okay. So just to conclude, okay, I think um, the most important thing, really, if you really, if you really have to remember just one thing from this lecture, is really not to mix the training validation and test sets. Okay, if you ever, if you ever plan to do this, you know, think about me, <laughs> and then you don't, then don't do it, you know, because you're making me sad if you do it. Perfect. So, Okay, so you know you really should understand your application very well to understand what metric you should use, and that's because you know, like I've shown you, there are so many of these kind of unexpected properties of uh, of these metrics. And you know, I've just only discussed I've only discussed uh, uh, AUC, but you know, I could do the same with precision recall curves, and you know, I could find some really I could you know like I could find more of these kind of funny things. And uh, you know, pretty much about any complex metric, I could find you some funny examples where, you know, where you wouldn't like, that you wouldn't expect uh, this behavior. So you really should try to understand your application and the metric. Okay, and you know, the truth is that evaluation of AI models is hard, and um, some of these properties you just won't guess without understanding them mathematically. So I think as scientists. I think one of the things that you should do is to periodically return to the definition of these metrics and try to understand them better and better. Try to kind of internalize these, you know, these kind of unexpected behaviors. Because you know, if you don't do it, then you're it's going to you're not going to bite you sooner or later. So uh, I very highly recommend doing this. Okay, and um, yeah, I really think that this is probably. You know, this is really probably the most important topic in machine learning to understand. Because if you don't, you know, you might, you know, you might just waste months or years of your work. And you don't want to do that because you would draw incorrect conclusions, and you know, and you waste your time, you waste everybody else's time. You know, so don't do it. Try to understand this very well. Thank you. Okay, and action. You know, if I just if I have just one one final piece of advice for you, you know, 
like start your Twitter account very early in your career, it's very useful, you know, it's very useful to, and it's actually, and I think Twitter is very, like you can keep up to date with, uh, you know, with latest like research, I really like it, so you should, you know, you should really do it and, you know, uh, yeah, and uh, anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the lectures and for your time here, because today is your last day here, but yeah. you're going to stay for a while, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, we are going to have a coffee break, but from us, from the organizers, we have something else for you. Oh, really? Yeah. So just as a small souvenir, thank you so much. Oh, really? Representing, uh, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll give it to my son, he will love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I was going to, I was going to, you know, I was, I was trying to like give him some machine learning toys, but I was like, yeah, I was, I don't know, I'm a biologist. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>